Uh, let me start, as, as I always do, by thanking Jack and Peter in particular for extending the invitation again. I, as Jack said, we go back a ways now, 13 years. Uh, it's been a spectacular association for me. Um, I so respect the work that you guys do. Uh, I'm increasingly critical of academics who work in this area because, especially in the United States, actually not so much around the world, but in the U.S., the academy has grown so large that it's come to constitute its own audience, and it only speaks to itself. And its ability to actually engage with stakeholders, with different constituencies, is very, very limited. And there are you know, organizations like the one Peter and Jack are, um, have been, have been you know, shaping for the last 15 years or so are so rare and so valuable because they're, they are bridges between an academic, academic establishment that tends to be very insular and self-referential and not very engaged in the world and then make, creating a bridge to folk like you who are really carrying on the work of struggle in the world. So what they do is extraordinarily valuable, and I always feel very privileged to be a part of this community. Um, and FSI is one of, uh, one of my, the highlights of my year every year for that reason. I in really respect the work that all of you are doing. Um, it's always something of a humbling experience to hear your stories. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's always a very engaging and intimidating challenge to try to take kind of arcane academic knowledge that I think I've gained from doing my research and translate it into insights, perceptions, ideas that may have some relevance for you guys. So I salute all of you for the work that you're doing. You know, the goal of FSI um, and indeed the broader work of ICNC is essentially increasing the capacity for agency among folk like you. Uh, I'd say the implicit message that you've been getting all week is that movements, the success of movements, depend critically on the courage, strategic skill, and knowledge of activists, of committed activists. And I would absolutely agree with that um, as a more than half of a more complicated story. But movements also depend, for the most part, with, with a few exceptions that I can think of, of broader environ environmental shifts uh, that create ruptures, that create fissures, cracks in established regimes, and that begin to undermine those regimes, that they render those regimes more vulnerable or maybe even receptive to challenge. To me, that's, it's that interaction that's the essence of contentious politics and that, what, that, that really shapes the ultimate fate of movements. It, there, so there are two stories, um, you know, cracks, fissures, openings, even slight ones at the top, and then pressure, really intelligent pressure from the bottom to exploit those cracks, to widen them, and to undermine or exploit the vulnerability of, of established re regimes. That's the complicated interaction that has been a focus of a lot of my work, not all of it, but a lot of it. And that's what I want to talk about again, because you've been getting a lot of, you know, from the bottom up, a sense of strategic understanding of situations, new knowledge, et cetera, sharing insights from your various struggles. To me, those struggles always have to be put into a broader environmental context. And so that's what I want to do today. I want to revisit the case that I know the best, and that's the American Civil Rights Movement, and tell both sides of that story. The top-down story, if you will, and then the bottom-up story. Uh, emphasizing again the interaction, the close connection between what activists did and why it mattered relative to the environmental cracks and fissures that were beginning to open in American society. So that's, that's my goal for the talk. And I'll try to be short. I'd much rather get into Q&A as quickly as possible. And Bill is going to stand up and go at some point, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up quickly. All right, let me start with the movement from above, and let me set the context. There have been two deadlocked presidential, hist uh, presidential elections in American history. 
and now the editorial aside, both of them have had disastrous consequences. One was 2000 when George W. Bush and Al Gore deadlocked, and we know how that one turned out, and we won't say any more about that. The other deadlock presidential election was 1876. And this also ended, in my view, disastrously. Uh, the, de the election was resolved when the Republican candidate, Rutherford B. Hayes, um, he, he made a deal. He basically cut a deal with uh, the Democratic uh, representatives in the House of Representatives, which is where the election was resolved, unlike the 2000 when the Supreme Court resolved the issue was thrown into the House of Representatives. The Republican candidate, Rutherford B. Hayes, cut a deal with the Democratic representatives from the southern United States, the former conf uh, the Confederate representatives, essentially. Uh, he agreed that he would withdraw federal troops from the South. The troops had been stationed there at the end of the Civil War to enforce new civil rights guarantees to African Americans in the South. And although that's a controversial period, the beginnings of democracy and, and, and equality were in place, or starting to be in place in the southern United States until federal troops were withdrawn. Essentially at that moment, race, the issue of race and civil rights was organized out of American politics again. Um, and control over racial matters was again granted to the southern United States. And although this is a tough competition, to me, among the darkest, most uh, horrific periods in American history and American race relations is 1876 to 1930, the period when Jim Crow segregation was put in place. This is a period in which 100, on average, 100 lynchings occurred each year. Some, many of these were actually uh, central events at state fairs, so they were done for entertainment. This is a brutal period about which we actually don't, there's not a tremendous amount of research. In any case, that's the context. And during that period, control over the system, the Jim Crow system, politically, socially, culturally, economically, is virtually um, unchallenged. Um, so tremendous control over the system by the Southern political and economic elite. But things begin, small cracks begin to develop in the system in the maybe as early as the 20s, certainly by the 30s, things are starting to change in ways that are beginning to weaken or undermine uh, the Jim Crow system. The first book I wrote focused on this period and some of the domestic changes that were beginning to undermine Jim Crow. I'll touch on a few just, just briefly. The big one for me was the decline of the cotton economy. The, co as long as the cotton economy was essentially the material underpinning of the whole system. This was a source of immense wealth, not just in the southern United States, but in the national economy. At one point, more than a quarter of all export dollars in the US economy was generated by the cotton economy. But that, the cotton economy began to decline even as early maybe as the teens, but certainly the 20s and the 30s, the Great Depression really dealt it a serious blow. So the cotton economy was in deep decline by the 30s. And this began to really undermine the material logic of the system, but it had other consequences as well. Uh, in particular, as the cotton economy declined, it pushed large numbers of agricultural laborers off the land. And this set in motion a massive redistribution of the country's population. The so-called Great Migration by which large numbers of African Americans, agricultural laborers from the South, moved north. Uh, about six million uh, net out migrants from African American out migrants from the southern United States between 1910 and 1960. This had huge consequences in all sorts of ways. But politically, I want to underscore the political significance of this. African Americans in the South in this period did not vote, essentially. By moving north, they didn't move to a promised land where everything was equal, but they did move to a situation where they voted. And they moved not randomly in the United States, but they settled in the key northern industrial states that held the, the real key to presidential elections. We're talking about New York and Pennsylvania and Illinois, et cetera. Uh, 
the, the so-called big eight states that commanded immense numbers of electoral votes and held the key to presidential politics. So as blacks moved into these northern industrial states, they began to exercise a lot of electoral power. And lots of analysts as early as the 30s started to talk about the growing importance of the black vote in American politics. That began to increase pressure on politicians, at least those with national aspirations, to begin at least rhetorically to start to embrace the need for some kinds of civil rights reform. So you have some degree of political opening or political increased political leverage to civil rights forces as a result of the Great Migration. Um, the Depression, just as the economic downturn of two years ago really did open the door for Obama, the Depression uh, essentially opened the door for Roosevelt. This is an important, this is a really important change. We in this country always, we take every presidential election every four years as a very competitive affair. It could go either way. The evidence suggests that's not true at all. That we have, it's a situation where we have these kind of enduring electoral regimes. So one party dominates for an extended period of time and then something has to change to actually change, to, to create a transitional election where the, the other party essentially comes to dominate for some period of time. 1932 was one such election. The Republicans had dominated presidential politics from 1900 to 1932. The Depression essentially leveraged the change and, and Roosevelt came in. He never addressed civil rights. Uh, in fact, I want to touch on that later. But he obviously did implement a lot of progressive policies uh, that did speak to the broader material -ish interests of minorities and other uh, traditionally disadvantaged groups in this country. Beyond that, uh, Roosevelt's election occasioned a very significant political shift within the Democratic Party. That's a party that had been dominated by Southern Dixiecrats. And the Roosevelt Northern Liberal Labor wing of the party became ascendant through that election. That was reinforced four years later, 1936, when the majority of African American voters switched their allegiance from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Now all of this is sort of confusing, even for a lot of Americans. Why were Democrats aligned with Roosevelt, liberal labor northern Democrats? Why were southern Dixiecrats, segregationists, conservative segregationists, diehard Democrats? The answer? Somebody knows. Yeah. It, it, well, it's, they, they were Democrats because they sure weren't going to be Republicans because Republican, the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln. So we have this strange alliance in American politics, very consequential alliance between northern liberal labor Democrats and southern racists. And because the southern racists will not vote Democratic, will not align with the De Republican Party, rather, you, that becomes the electoral basis for the New Deal coalition, a 36-year period in which Democrats dominate the White House and are able to implement a lot of progressive change uh, or in introduce a lot of progressive change into the country. African Americans voted Republican loyally until 36 because it was the party of Lincoln. But Roosevelt spoke to their interests, and so African American <laughs> voters become very loyal Democrats, and that further strengthens the hands of the liberal northern labor Democrats and further marginalized southern Dixiecrats. Follow? There are going to be other changes, but I'll talk about them down the road. And in any case, that's the major domestic changes that are undermining, beginning to undermine the system of racial politics in this country and the Jim Crow system even more broadly. Without discounting the importance of those domestic change processes, however, it now seems clear to me that the key moment spelling the end of the Jim Crow system uh, was not domestic. It was the onset of the Cold War. Sorry. Thank you, Mary. Jim Crow is a, an elaborate system of caste restrictions in the southern United States. Every aspect of life was regulated by race. So this is, you know, again, white-only drinking fountains, black-only restrooms. Blacks could eat here but not here. They could, they could get a hotel room here but not here. 
every aspect of Southern life was segregated, divided. Uh, brutally oppressive period. Uh, not as bad as slavery, but you're, you're, gonna, it's gonna, you're not gonna convince me it's much, much worse, or much better, that's for sure. Thank you, Mary. In any case, the Cold War is critical. All of these domestic change processes are indeed undermining the foundations of Jim Crow, weakening the system, but nothing fundamentally changes until the Cold War, and then things change very quickly. You get a sense of the, how quickly things change by uh, the otherwise puzzling contrast between two consecutive American presidents, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who served from 1932 until his death in 1945, and then his vice president, who takes over as president at his death, that's Harry Truman, takes over in 1945. Here's the puzzling contrast. So FDR is arguably the most popular president in US history. He was elected four times. That's not possible anymore. In fact, because he was elected four times, people thought we needed an amendment to prevent that. But he was elected four times, and he won by enormous margins every time. He was virtually unassailable as a politician in this country. So he's not, very, he's not electorally vulnerable. He's winning landslides, number one. Number two. For most of his time in office, he's governing during arguably the most progressive period in US history. That's the 1930s. He's got, in his cabinet and informal advisors, he's surrounded by certainly liberals, but socialists as well. This is a period where socialists actually have a voice in government in the US. So he's governing during a very progressive time. Um, he himself is a liberal. Uh, and again, he's, he's, um, uh, he, he's electorally, uh, virtually unbeatable. And yet, he never once comes out in favor of civil rights reform during his 13 years in office. Not once. Um, why not? Because he doesn't want to antagonize the southern wing of his party, the Dixiecrats. Um, he, he probably is going to get their vote, if, even if he comes out for civil rights reform. But the key uh, the, the, the key members of Congress are Southern Democrats. Why? Because committee chairmanships in the House and the Senate go to those who are most senior. Who's most senior? The Southern Democrats. Why? Because there's only one party in the South. So they win every time. So they control the legislative apparatus in Congress, and Roosevelt wants to play ball with those guys, doesn't want to antagonize them. He sees no political gain in coming out in favor of civil rights reform, even though that fits his values. Okay, fast forward to Truman, who again takes office at Roosevelt's death in 1945. The war has just ended. Within a year, Truman issues the first executive order uh, um, in favor of civil rights reform since Reconstruction. It's a shockwave to the Southern Dixiecrats, because here's the president of their party a Southern Democrat, by the way, Harry Truman, um, coming out in favor publicly of civil rights reform. Before he's done, he'll issue four executive orders pushing for civil rights change in various venues, various institutions in American life. He makes civil rights reform the central, one of the central planks of his party's platform when he runs for re-election in 1948. Um, he, uh, he creates, with great fanfare, a national committee to investigate civil rights and to recommend remedies for civil rights abuses in the United States. Nothing like this had happened since, since Reconstruction, 1876. Essentially, he renationalizes race in this country and angers the Southern Dixiecrats. Now, again, think of the difference here. Why in the heck is Truman saying anything about civil rights? He is very electorally vulnerable, whereas Roosevelt was not. He's not a popular guy. He's not an incumbent. He takes over again at Roosevelt's death. So he has everything to lose domestically by embracing civil rights reform and angering the southern wing of his party. And believe me, he angers the southern wing of his party, so much so that they run a third party candidate um, from the state's rights party. This is a man named uh, Strom Thurmond. Strom Thurmond died in office at 103 as a Republican when? Five years ago? Four years ago? 
He served for 70 years, okay? But he was the states' rights party candidate for president in 1948 because they were angry at, Rosa, uh, at Truman and they wanted out. They broke with the, uh, the Democratic Party. And everybody thought Truman was going to lose. There's a famous newspaper, I mean, this famous photo of Harry Truman holding up a newspaper headline that says Truman loses because everybody assumed he was going to lose and he barely squeaked through. But he was risking a lot domestically by embracing civil rights reform. So what was he doing? He also was not governing during a progressive period. He's governing during the Cold War 40s. So this is a very conservative period in American history. Uh, he himself was at best a moderate Democrat. And again, if you read the good biographies of Truman, he was a product of his times. He was a southern white male. He was a racist. He came to a different understanding about the issue later in his life. But this is not Roosevelt, a true liberal at all. So why is he acting? He's acting because of the Cold War. He's exercising foreign policy. This is not about the scales falling, you know, kind of falling from his eyes and him engaging in kind of moral domestic politics at all. The central policy imperative is the ideological struggle with the Soviet Union. And American style racism is a horrible foreign policy liability in 46 and 7 and 8. You've got nationalist movements bubbling up in Southeast Asia and Africa. And these are peoples of color aspiring to be free. And the Soviet Union and the United States are locked into this intense ideological struggle for influence around the globe. Yeah, American style racism doesn't play very well as a, uh, as a, pro as a, you know, as a calling card as you seek to influence friends around the world. And the Soviet Union played up American style racism at every opportunity. So what was going on in this period is not domestic, a kind of domestic reimagining of race. It's, it's Truman's waging foreign policy in embracing civil rights reform. The pressure to do, to do, to do so come first from uh, the diplomatic corps and the State Department, and then it really he takes it to heart and he begins to push his Justice Department to file friends of the suit brief, friends of the court brief on behalf of civil rights litigants, et cetera. So that is that broader set of issues, the, the renationalization of race as a function of the Cold War, creates a context in which the civil rights movement enjoys enormous leverage and all sorts of points of vulnerability in the system. So that's the movement from above. And I'll try to move quickly through the movement from below because Bill's back, they're going like this. All right, movement from below. So was the civil rights revolution primarily a product of these broader environmental shifts? Absolutely not. As I argued at the outset, successful movements normally reflect a combination of favorable environmental changes and the creative efforts of activists to recognize, exploit, and indeed expand or widen the political opportunities afforded them by these broader environmental shifts. And let me make it clear, objective changes are much less important than what acti activists do with them. What understandings they bring to those opportunities and what strategies they fashion to exploit them. That's the, that's the genius of, that's the important genius of the movement from below. It'd be impossible to identify all the ways in which grassroots activists expanded those opportunities, indeed dramatically widened the possibilities for action in this country. But let me highlight a couple processes that I think are critically important. The first, the social construction of political opportunity. That is the recognition of particular points of vulnerability within the system that the activists really aggressively exploited. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. So, uh, you know, this is pre-war. This is Prior to, uh, prior to World War II, and pr so prior to the, re-nationaliz the renationalization of race as a function of the Cold War. One of the real significant institutional effects of, pre of Roosevelt's presidency was that he began, he, he got to actually begin to appoint Supreme Court justices after a 32 year period of Republican appointments. For those who are, uh, sort of know the history, he actually battled with the Supreme Court his whole first term in office and it was, his, it was the thorn in his side because you had a conservative Supreme Court ruling against any number of his New Deal programs. And at one point he thought about 
expanding the number of members of the court so he could appoint some, some people called packing the court. In any case, he, eventually he outlasted the conservative uh, Supreme Court and was able to post enough liberal jurists to the court to start changing the, the nature of the court and its ideological leanings. The NAACP in 37 and 38 began to recognize that this was happening and their whole strategy to carefully select cases to gradually undermine separate but equal, the doctrine of legal segregation, uh, was a function of them recognizing that something was changing in the Supreme Court and if they carefully chose cases, they felt they could gradually undermine the legal underpinnings of Jim Crow. We all know Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, but that was the culmination of a 17-year legal campaign that was leveraged by this understanding of the moment that was opening up in the Supreme Court. Um, I could give you other examples. A. Philip Randolph, the March on Washington movement is a little known chapter in American history that's fascinating and exactly illustrates the brilliance of um, a grassroots leader recognizing a point of vulnerability and playing it to the hilt successfully. But I, I'll, I'll back off unless somebody wants to ask me about that in the Q&A. Because I want to mention the last piece of this and then I'll, I'll stop. The politics of moral suasion, the unique uh, strategic dynamic that civil rights activists perfected over the heyday of the civil rights struggle, which I char would characterize as 55 to 65. Um, it isn't enough uh, for activists to recognize political opportunities. They have to find ways to exploit them successfully. And I think the strategic genius, the unique genius of the civil rights movement was to, care, to really understand where the system was vulnerable and to uh, fashion a strategic dynamic that brilliantly exploited the unique vulnerabilities in the system. The system wasn't vulnerable all over. It was vulnerable in particular places. And the task of civil rights activists was to figure out what kind of strategic uh, deployment of nonviolence would actually exploit those particular system vulnerabilities. And let me just mention a few aspects of the overall system that they had to take into account. For starters, Jim Crow, although racism was endemic to the United States, the system they were attacking was in the South. It's where the Jim Crow system was in place. So they sought to mobilize, organize there, but they had no strategic le leverage in the South at all. They didn't vote, so they had no particular way to leverage change in the Southern United States. So whatever tactic they used, actually had to uh, transfer the, the control over the issue to the federal level. But they knew they had to act in the South, but they weren't going to get anywhere by appealing to Southern officials. So ultimately, their tactics had to reach the federal level. Um, and yes, as I'm saying, the Cold War dynamic, we're talking about 55, 65, the heart of the Cold War, yes, the federal government was vulnerable. The American state, the federal state was vulnerable to challenge on this issue, but not if uh, there was no publicity attached to their, the activities of civil rights uh, activists. Uh, and as I'm saying, the New Deal, during this period, it's, um, it's primarily Democratic presidents who are in office. And yes, they're vulnerable, again, on this issue, but they also do not want to needlessly antagonize the Southern Dixiecrats, who are the other wing of their party and on whom they also rely for votes and support in Congress. You follow? So you've got a federal establishment, yes, vulnerable on this issue, but also not wanting to antagonize the white South. So what do you do? The civil rights activists ultimately created, uh, I think, a brilliant strategic response to, or crafted a brilliant strategic response to this set of institutional constraints. Uh, they would stage very public, um, I think, morally resonant um, uh, demonstrations of our confrontations between good movement, bad system, 
essentially inviting white violence. And when that white violence came, the media covered it, not just domestic media, not just the national media, but the international media. And it provoked outrage domestically and internationally. Every time the fire hoses and the police dogs came out, those headlines, those pictures went around the world and exacerbated the, the, the Cold War dilemma that I was talking about earlier. When there was no publicity and there was no outrage, the federal government didn't act. When the federal government was subject to international criticism, then and only then would an otherwise reluctant federal government intervene in support of the movement. But that's how the movement pushed, that's the, that's the dynamic it refined over this 10 years, of the, 10 years of the period. One last case, just to illustrate the point about how they refined this dynamic. I still think there's such an interesting contrast between two very similar campaigns, one in Albany, Georgia in 1962, the other in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. Most of you know about Birmingham. If you don't, you know the pictures from Birmingham. You probably don't know Albany. Albany, Georgia, Martin Luther King went in organized the same kind of community-wide uh, set of, um, of, of activities um, that he would subsequently, they'd use subsequently in Birmingham. But the, the sheriff in uh, Albany, Georgia, a man named Lori Pritchett, absolutely, I think, understood this dynamic and, and the fact that violence was required to make it work. And he told all his officers, you can ar arrest everybody, put everybody in jail, no violence. And he restrained the, the, the Ku Klux Klan. I don't know how he did it, but he actually managed to keep the other white se segregationists, se white supremacists in the area more or less in check. So the campaign lasted 13 months. Over 5,000 people served time in jail. It was a massive expenditure of time and energy on the part of the civil rights forces. It never made headline, headlines beyond the first two weeks because there was no violence. And the federal government never intervened. Birmingham, a year later, King says candidly in one of his books that they, he, they felt they learned lessons in Albany and they picked Birmingham quite consciously because the, pre, the sheriff there, who's actually called the uh, Commissioner of Public Safety, a man named Bull Connors, was one of the most notorious racist sheriffs in the South. He had just been defeated in an election. He was going to be out of office in three months and they moved up the campaign because they knew a good enemy when they saw one. And for about, two, and Lori Pritchett, we now know this, went to Bull Connors and said, we won in Albany because we didn't respond with violence. Keep it, hold it together. Bull Connors went, okay. Three days in he went, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> and the police dogs and the fire hoses came out and those headlines went around the world at a critical time in the, in the Cold War. And Kennedy was forced to intervene in a very dramatic way. It also pushed, increased pressure on Congress to deliver meaningful civil rights reform, which they did in 64, 65. So again, this is about a set of emerging institutional or environmental vulnerabilities and the strategic genius of civil rights forces to recognize what they were and to craft strategies to exploit those specific institutional vulnerabilities. It's that dynamic interaction that I think is so critical. And so as you're learning more skill or you're gaining more new knowledge this week and thinking about different kinds of strategic tactics and what works one place and what works, doesn't work another place, always remember that these, this knowledge has to be applied in context with real sensitivity to the unique institutional features of this, this setting or that setting. Um, and that one kit bag doesn't work for all. I'll stop there. <laughs> Mary. Mary was there. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful analysis and uh, all true. And I would just like to add on to it one piece of something else that was going on in the 1930s because Peter Ackerman and Jack Duvall in FSI and the people from Fletcher are involved in sharing knowledge. You mentioned knowledge at the end of your presentation. There was another kind of sharing of knowledge 
that helped the activists become so smart. All during the 1930s, black leaders from the United States were traveling by steamship to India. And they were sitting with the leaders of the various independence struggles. Sometimes they sat with Gandhi. Jack made reference to this on the first day. He told you what Gandhi said to someone from Howard University. This was extremely important because they returned to their universities, their churches, their banks, their newspapers, and they taught and they preached and they wrote articles. And they were consciously looking to raise up a black Gandhi. And a historian named Sudarshan Kapoor went into the morgues of the black newspapers in the United States and read all the records of the newspaper accounts of the black leaders who had gone to India and then came back to educate the black community about how to fight for their rights. And Jim Lawson spent three years in India. The uh, Methodist Church got him out of federal prison where he was in prison because he was a conscientious objector against the Korean War. And that's why he was able to teach us the theories and methods of nonviolent action. So we're all involved in transmission of knowledge. I just want to highlight that as one additional feature of what was going on. You were so right. Yeah, absolutely. Can you apply this model, which I think is fantastic, to uh, any of the following three uh, current uh, uh, events, current issues. Uh, immigration reform to legalize citizenship for 12 million Mexican Americans and others. Uh, drug policy reform where this fall in California there's a referendum to legalize marijuana and where groups have been exploiting these cracks and, and these trends similarly. And the other one may, might be outside of your box, but have you looked at the country of Mexico and the huge changes that have been going on there with the free trade and the migration and, and the poverty, et cetera, uh, the change in parties, and, and how Mexican change agents, grassroots fighters, might exploit these situations similar to the way the Southern Civil Rights Movement did. Well, the last one probably is sort of outside my box, as you say, although certainly, I mean, I'll, I'll, one little small piece, NAFTA, created certain kinds of institutional openings um, uh, that, have in, that has encouraged cross-border mo uh, mobilization by labor activists and human rights activists. So the NAFTA, the institution of NAFTA, certainly as an institutional shift, created certain kinds of points of access or entree for activists on both sides of the border. And I, I know that story, the broader story of Mexico, I would defer. I would defer to you on, but the other ones you mentioned in the U.S. The issue of immigration reform, I think, is a very interesting one. Um, I uh, this this past year, I was um, some, the Phi Beta Kappa, which is a national honorary society in this country, has a visiting scholar program, and every year, I don't know how many. I think it's eight uh, senior scholars are asked to be Phi Beta Kappa visiting scholars and to you have to commit to going to 10 member institutions and staying for two days and giving a lot of public lectures and so forth. And they ask you to, to, give, uh, to, to, um, to provide four or five talks you're prepared to give. And one of them that I talked about was Obama's election. And what, what do the election results in 08 suggest about whether this might also be a transitional election? That is, moving us from um, an electoral regime where Republicans have dominated from 68 to 2008, maybe to a period of time where we could imagine an extended regime, a democratic controlled regime. And so that was one of the talks I gave. And everybody want, wanted to focus on race in that election, maybe young people, et cetera. Um, the Hispanic vote is arguably to me the, most, the single most important piece of that complicated electoral puzzle. The uh, Hispanic voters in this country, first of all, they're a very diverse lot because we're talking about Cuban Americans, Puerto Rican Americans, Mexican Americans, et cetera. So there's no modal Hispanic voter. But um, admitting that diversity, in point of fact, in for the last four or five elect presidential elections prior to Obama, uh, 
the Hispanic vote has been a very competitive piece of the electoral puzzle. It's broken about 60-40. That is 60% Democrat, 40% Republican, which is pretty darn competitive. On Obama, it was 75-25 Democrat-Republican, and that's not pro-Obama in my view. That's much more about anger at Republicans for the stance on immigration that led to the massive protests in 05, 06. Um, but when I was giving this talk this year, this was pre the Arizona law. For those who don't know, and I'm, most of you don't know, Arizona's passed a very dicey piece of legislation. I think it'll be overturned on constitutional challenges, but right now it's in effect and it essentially gives carte blanche to police officers to stop anybody on suspicion of being an illegal, okay? And, but this, this just happened. When I was giving the talk in this past year, I said, you know, 75-25, so the, the vote split very pro-Democrat. Given how fast the Hispanic segment of the electorate is growing, if, Demo if that percentage sort of settled in around 75-80%, so it was very heavily Democratic, it has enormous implications for elections in New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, et cetera. Lots of states that have been more or less in the Republican column for a long time. But I, would, I said in giving this talk, but you know, that issue was hotter in 2008, more present in the minds of Hispanic voters in 08, than it may be now, given that the, the issue has not been on the radar very much. Well, it's back on the radar in a big, big way. And the Hispanic anger over that is palpable. So, you know, uh, to me, this is again about a set of institutional opportunities to the extent that the Hispanic vote becomes that much more significant and is dramatically more pro-Democrat. It does have serious implications, not just for presidential elections, but for the possibilities of immigration reform in this country. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, while Roosevelt's one of my favorite presidents, he's by no means perfect. I mean, oh, uh, <laughs> let me, don't get me started on that. I, he's not even one of my favorite presidents. <laughs> Go ahead. But, um, well, you tell me why you hate well, him. Well, obviously, the, <laughs> it would be Hiroshima, which is the biggest yeah. example of... Uh, oh, that was on Truman's watch. Right, but it's toward the end of yeah. his administration. Either way, um, I think it's also important to re realize that, um, you know, he had a wife as well, and Eleanor Roosevelt was pretty um, influential in in the civil rights movement, and I was wondering if you had a little bit of insight on what Eleanor Roosevelt provided for the civil rights movement. I think Eleanor Roosevelt was, was actually very important because, and I don't know, no one's, I, I, I asked a couple of historians, New Deal historians, Roosevelt historians, whether they've ever found anything in the archives that suggests there was actually a conscious division of labor on this score, where Roosevelt said, look, or that is FDR said, I can't antagonize the white south, so I ain't going to say nothing. But why don't you organize a concert with Marian Anderson at, you know, why don't you, why don't you attend uh, integrated events? Why don't, why don't you refuse to attend segregated events? These, uh, these acts on her part were hugely important in terms of giving a sense of new possibility, a sense of hope. Um, so, uh, I actually don't, I suspect, we, we sort of know they were, they were not exactly the closest of couples. Uh, so I don't think there was any conscious division of labor being worked out here. I suspect she actually was really pissed at him for being such a coward on this issue. That, that would be my guess, um, and he didn't want to hear it. Um, let me underscore that, this point, though. Um, when I was a hopelessly clueless graduate student, I was studying the Civil Rights Movement, that was going to be my dissertation. But I walked into a project where the methodology was we were coding newspaper articles. And I, I couldn't believe my luck that I walked into a project that had been going for two years. And the structure of the project was that um, it was a project on movements of the 60s in the United States. And there were like 20 or I don't remember, 18 movements available for graduate students to sign on for, right? And nobody had picked the civil rights movement, even though the project had been going for two years. And I, I, I walked into this and I went, idiots. Uh, maybe they went, well, there's going to be an awful lot of stories in the newspapers. I don't want to work that hard. 
I don't know what the motivation was, but I grabbed a hold of the civil rights movement. And then I had to fashion a coding scheme to try to extract from the newspaper information on civil rights activities. And this is how clueless I was on kind of historical continuities, long periods of time, causal forces embedded in history. I started my coding scheme in 1950 because Montgomery started in 55. And I was just like, probably the key to where, why it started was in 52. You know, duh. And I was still kind of laboring under this ahistorical sense of how movements get started quickly. And I was lucky enough to, um, to be connected to this extraordinary woman, Ella Baker, who was living in New York at the time. And Ella Baker had been involved in virtually every significant chapter of, of civil rights activism in the United States from the late teens up, up until the time I got an opportunity to talk with her. And I went in to interview her, and I was asking her questions about what was going on in 52. <laughs> and she put up with this for about 20 minutes. She was a very gracious, very kind of formal, soft-spoken woman. But she basically said, you're an idiot. <laughs> and she said, let me tell you about you. At the very least, you have to understand something about the 30s. And she said, do you know who uh, Joe Lewis was? Most of you will not. Joe Lewis was a heavyweight boxer. And he was heavyweight champ for a period of time. He was, he was black. And I knew that. I'm a big sports fan. So I said, yeah, he was a boxer. And at that time, he was a greeter at a, at a Las Vegas casino and kind of a sad figure. So it was like, what does this have to do with African-American freedom struggle? And she said, do you have any idea what life was like in black communities in the United States on nights he fought? And I went, no. And she said, life stopped. We anticipated for weeks. And on those nights, we'd gather in the homes that had radios. And if he won, we were lifted for weeks. And if he lost, we carried that burden for weeks. Because here's the story, of course, that I didn't really know at the time. Jack Johnson was another great black heavyweight who won the crown in the late 1800s. And this was the height of Jim Crow. And this was such an affront to white supremacy that essentially black fighters were marginalized, were pushed out of the game. That's why they were pushed out of baseball, all professional sports. Because you can't have a black man dominate a sport in a society that's absolutely committed to the idea of white supremacy. So let's remove the risk that that might happen. So Joe Lewis was the first black heavyweight who was allowed back in, and he won. That suggested that there were new possibilities afoot. And Eleanor Roosevelt, we think these things are trivial now. They gave hope. So at the same time, Mary's talking about new knowledge coming into those communities. New hope was coming into these communities. So the, the roots of the struggle go way, way back, even if it only the, mass, the true mass movement only develops in Montgomery in 55. Um, I, well, now I want to know, I'll start out with a simple one. I'm curious who your favorite president is. <laughs> but um, my other questions are, um, one is how much the uh, Roosevelt's New Deal was kind of uh, subversively doing the work of civil rights, um, whether it was unintentional or intentional, um, whether it was like paving the way in many ways for the civil rights movement to be uh, possible and how much it was affecting black Americans on a kind of economic level. Um, and then also, in terms of the Cold War and the kind of legitimacy that the, the U.S. wanted to have, th that their that overt racism was undermining, um, and you, you talked about how that was a foreign policy issue, but I'm curious to what extent it was also a domestic issue in terms of because of the Communist Party within the U.S. their anti-racism, anti-racist activity. Um, was there fear of a defection, and was there how much did the can you just talk about, I guess, the, the U.S. Histor history doesn't really talk about the cooperation between communists and, and civil rights activists. So if you could just talk about that a little okay. bit. Okay. Those are great issues. On the first issue, whether the New Deal programs were themselves doing the work of civil rights. In general, no, quite the opposite. Um, the, I can't. I don't want to get into specifics, but a number of programs that required some level of, of local input into 
uh, crop subsidies, acreage allowances, et cetera, agricultural policy. And in the South, although this was supposed to be sort of popular input from all parties, essentially these all were, were white run. And the whole notion of black participation in these programs was, although it was supposed to happen, it didn't happen. And Roosevelt got lots of complaints and went, let's not go there. So in the actual administration of New Deal programs, there was a lot of racism, a lot of very explicit racism. I think the New Deal programs and rhetoric were doing a lot, ultimately, to lay the foundation for civil rights. But it wasn't in the programs themselves. It was in the issues that were being addressed, the language that was being used, the hope that people were beginning to feel, et cetera, but not on the actual mechanics of the programs. Secondly, on the issue of sort of the domestic aspect of civil rights. I mean, I'm emphasizing the positive effects of the Cold War, the renationalization of race as a result of the Cold War. I see a, there a real cost to the movement in a sense, in that the movement exploited the possibilities inherent in that moment and actually played up the issue of um, uh, the struggle with the Soviet Union and how the civil rights movement was a fundamentally positive democratic force, et cetera, et cetera. So the movement marginalized links to the left. The 30s was full of a much broader vision of racial justice than the Cold War period. You follow? So there was lots of connections uh, between the left and the civil rights movement in the 30s and a broader vision of racial justice. The movement made common cause with anti-Soviet propaganda. They exploited the Cold War vulnerability very successfully, but in doing so, they narrowed the vision of the movement. And Malcolm X pointed that out repeatedly. King, to his credit, began to broaden out the sense of the issues um, at, before his death. But if anything, the, the Cold War context blurred, I think blunted the connections between the kind of progressive left and the civil rights movement. And the civil rights movement itself was sort of, was subject to red baiting periodically and the movement itself engaged in that pr process. So some negative consequences there, I'd say. Well, not during that period, because again, that you would be subject to severe repression if you sought to build that broader left vision of the struggle. You follow? Um, so lots of red baiting of the movement as it was, but it wound up cloaking itself in patriotism to be able to exploit this kind of um, this this Cold War moment, if you will. I, I'd just like to expand a little bit on the Joe Lewis analogy because he became briefly uh, a symbol for the whole country in the struggle with the Nazis As in, the spelling, and, in the spelling fights. Right. And so I'm not sure, but I don't think there's an earlier example of a point where one person personified. Sure, Jesse Owens. The, yeah, Jesse well, Owens. I'm. Right. Jesse Owens is pre uh, the Except that, fights in 37, 38. Right. But those were like, Owens won his races. This was a head to head, you know. That's true. That's thing. True. And he had lost once and then he won. Right. So, but it wasn't just a national thing. Right. It, both of those men took it to an international level. Absolutely. Great point. Great point. Way in the back, Peter. Thanks again, Doug. Sure. It's, it was always fun to hear your presentation. I wanted to ask uh, you to just clarify a little bit of your opening commentary, which is a bit more theoretical. And you made a point about sometimes conditions are important considerations to how these movements unfold. Are you saying that the that movements can be, no matter how skilled, and willing the people are in resistance that there are conditions which make it virtually impossible for them to act? Or are you saying is that a movement to be successful has to be able to um, exploit the conditionalities 
that give them an opportunity in a particular moment? Or are you saying that until a movement decides it wants to act, any kinds of inhibiting conditions will be successful? How do we put this in the mix to sort of come to the end point, which I'm going to have to deal with a little bit later, is that are there circumstances that you foresee where conditions make a civil resistance movement impossible? I don't think I'd ever say impossible. I'd say that dramatically reduce the likelihood of success and dramatically increase the possibilities of repression and real cost to the movement, human cost to the movement. Um, uh, I, I think all systems, even those that seem most secure, there are cracks. There are points of leverage. Um, but again, I think it is, it's reasonable to assume that regimes can be arrayed along a continuum from those that um, uh, you know, enjoy the support of virtually all elite segments of the country and strong international alliances and have a deeply loyal armed services and secret police or whatever. On the one hand, that, you know, very, very, very secure regimes where there's virtually no cracks in the alliances, both international and domestic, that support it, and loyal armed forces or security apparatus. And then on this end, regimes that are just weak states and are constantly being <laughs> replaced, et cetera. And movements that challenge, you know, uh, movements probably can have in history challenged regimes along the entire continuum, but I assume the chances of success and least cost to the movement and human suffering are as you shade towards this end of the continuum. That's all I'm really saying. They're certainly at this extreme end one should be extraordinarily cautious about advising grassroots groups to openly challenge the system. Uh, but I would not rule out the possibility that there are specific points of vulnerability where if correctly attacked, you couldn't begin to actually weaken that state. So this is a probabilistic assessment. Uh, and you guys are totally aware of this. I mean, you always counsel uh, individuals to be very sensitive to local context. This is not, here's your kit bag, go overthrow a regime. This is, these are some, this is, these are, this is what we think we've learned over a long period of time looking at a lot of cases. See, but you ultimately will be the ones who will make the judgment about which of these pieces of knowledge uh, make sense given the specific institutional vulnerabilities that you confront. But, a, an acute awareness of those institutional points of vulnerability, I think, is as important as courage, commitment, knowledge in general terms. That's all I'm saying. Okay, final question. Sure. Doug, if you need a water, it's right below you on the show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for a wonderful analysis. Um, I'm just wondering, um, I read a book some time ago that was um, contrasting the approaches of um, Martin Luther King um, uh, Jr. and the people he worked with on the one hand and Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam and that was suggesting that um, uh, although the two had very different approaches uh, they ended up sort of reinforcing each other that the more Malcolm uh, hyped up the rhetoric of separatism and um, possible violence um, he hastened he, he made the white establishment uh, understand what the eventual, um, uh, the eventual outcome of this struggle might be if, if they did not see the ground. Um, could you make a comment on, uh, maybe not, not, not in terms of the conditions you've described, but uh, two aspects of a struggle, like um, you know, Martin versus Malcolm, and how they might in a sense, uh, although seeking a similar outcomes through different um, means, how one might end up um, um, complementing, complementing the other. And especially because, I mean, we are gathered here, we are nonviolent activists, but we work in contexts where there are others who are committed right. to, to violent means and how we can take advantage of, of, that, of that sort of dynam dynamic. That's another great question. Um, and it's a real tricky one. I think that um, there is a literature um, that suggests that um, that kind of, ha having the presence of that kind of tactical variety 
in a struggle benefits a movement. Uh, the term that's used in the literature is radical flank effects. I want to come back, though, because I was talking with Kurt earlier today, and there appears to be data that suggests something different. Um, but th this literature I'm talking about, I think, is exclusively in Western democracy, so it may be partly a context issue. But that literature, I haven't contributed to it, but, but my reading of the literature is pretty clear, and this is certainly a consensus that's been reached by social movement scholars, is that if you have um, a, that kind of tactical diversity present in a movement, um, so you've got a kind of radical fringe, if you will, to the movement, that state authorities are going to be, uh, th the threat of that radical flank is going to increase the legitimacy and maybe the leverage and maybe even the entree of the moderates. You follow? But again, I was talking with Kurt, and there, he was talking about cases in which the, the statistical results look different. I think those are mostly international, or they're? Uh, yeah, com uh, comparatively. Com right. OK, so it may be that in different settings, um, uh, less democratic settings, it may not have the same kind of effect. I, I wouldn't even speculate as to why that may be. My reading of the civil rights movement is definitely that as the movement got broader and there was more tactical variety, that in fact that really did aid the movement. Um, you know, you have to remember in 1957, 56, 57, in the southern United States, in the wake of this Brown v. Board of Education, in the wake of Montgomery, the Montgomery bus boycott, the NAACP, which we now regard, in hi historians tend to regard as a very conservative organization, it was ruled as an illegal organization. It was, they didn't use the terrorist word. But the southern United, most southern states passed laws that outlawed the, the, national, the NAACP. Um, when King came along, King made the NAACP look very moderate. When SNCC came along, it made King look more moderate. When Malcolm achieved the level of visibility he achieved in 64 and 5, he made King look positively presidential. <laughs> so as you shift, and when the Black Panthers appear, that, you know, that dynamic, I think, my, that's been my sense as a scholar of this civil rights movement, that that did, was an advantage to the movement for the reasons that you're talking about. But I want to be very careful about this because there, there, there appear to be cases that are, that are quite different. And I think we're, we're going to cut it off there. Okay.